Hi, my name is Jeremy Bernanski, and you're about to watch a brand new episode of Bernanski's Vlog. This is a weekly show that drops every Monday at 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time on YouTube. In this show, we cover movie news, movie reviews, and a little bit more. If this is your first time with us, consider clicking that subscribe button. For everybody who's returning, thank you so much. And as always, if you enjoy any portion of this show, give me that thumbs up button. Let's go ahead and cut now to this week's episode. Good morning. It's Monday morning. It's 10 a.m. PST, and that means it's time for another episode of Bernanski's Vlog. This is season two, episode one, or episode 23 if you're keeping track on a little clicker. We got a lot of great stuff to talk about this week for the season two opener, and I don't want to spend too much time on this introduction, but I do want to say that I hope everybody had a very happy new year and they were able to celebrate it with friends, family, and loved ones. Also, thank you guys so much for coming back and joining us for season two. If this is your first time joining us, go ahead and give us a thumbs up if you enjoy any portion and click that subscribe button too. That way you don't miss any future content that will be dropped on this channel. We got a lot of great news stories to talk about. Plus all the money in the world is going to be the movie review this week. And we'll take a look at what's arriving in theaters. Also what's arriving on DVD and Blu-ray for your home theater. And as always, we've got our certified rad segment to close off the show. All right. I don't want to take up any more time with this introduction. You're watching Bernanski's vlog. This is season two, episode one on YouTube. Let's go ahead and roll now to this week's news. In the news, 2017 saw a 25-year low in movie attendance. At the same time, Disney crossed $6 billion worldwide, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson saw Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle cross $200 million in the domestic box office. So what does this tell us? This tells us that while ticket sales were down and people were getting out to the theaters less in 2017 than in the past 25 years, it still didn't stop them from going back and revisiting the movies that they really, really enjoyed. Disney did have some big hitters drop over the last year because Disney includes movies like Beauty and the Beast remake, it includes Star Wars, it includes the Marvel movies. So Disney was poised to have a great year regardless because so far the films that they're dropping have really been hitting it out of the park. Some films have had mixed reception, so The Last Jedi, Ant-Man, there are these movies that drop where people are like, meh, yes or no, and we get into some spirited debate online about it. But collectively, the majority of films that Disney drops are pretty well received and it really shows when you have people showing up less for more films but showing up more for the films that they're enjoying that really speaks to the product that Disney is delivering consistently through not only the brand name of Disney but also through the subsidiaries that roll up to Disney such as Lucasfilm and Marvel. Also, Sony stepping in with a big way when they had Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle. Now, previously, The Rock has seen a lot of box office success in the Fast and Furious franchise. However, this is really his first solo venture that's really catapulted itself this quickly to overtake the $200 million spot. And for me personally, I really enjoyed Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle. I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. And if you saw my recap, the best films of 2017, I mentioned that as one of my top 10 films of the year because of how well the story delivered on what I believe it wanted to deliver on. So if you haven't seen that, I'll go ahead and throw the card up right here and you can just go ahead and revisit that episode, which was a Facebook live stream. And you can just revisit the best of 2017 in film as far as this channel was concerned with my vote. But overall, I don't really think that this is like a precursor to a doomsday scenario for theater going. Because again, we all went out to see the movies we wanted to see. And then we went back to see those movies again. Now, yes, maybe we didn't get out to see as many films collectively as studio heads would have wanted us to. But when the studios delivered a really great engaging story that was fun or scary because it made a lot of money and that was not a fun movie that was a scary horror film and that still made a ton of money so it didn't really matter if it was a horror film if it was a fun family action film if it was a science fiction space odyssey like star wars or whether it was something like an avengers film or you know just any number of the marvel characters we still enjoyed these 
films because they told the stories really well. And then we said, we're gonna go back and we're gonna keep supporting these films because they told the story so well. Something in those stories resonated with us as an audience, and then in turn, we gave our hard-earned dollars back to the studios via ticket sales. But maybe we didn't get out to see, you know, 100 films. Maybe we only saw 50, but we saw those 50 films two or three times in theaters. That's kind of what it's looking like. So I don't see this as a doomsday scenario for theater going, because to me, this says we still went to the theater, and then we went back to the theater to see and enjoy one, two, three more times those films that really hit home for us as an audience. Comment below with your favorite film of last year and how many times you actually went back to the theater to see it. The Writers Guild of America and the Producers Guild of America released their list of nominees for Best Original Screenplay and Best Adapted Screenplay, as well as Outstanding Producer of Theatrical Motion Pictures. So this was worded kind of odd because it makes it sound like the Writers Guild and the Producers Guild are all kind of releasing the same list, which is not the case. The Screenwriters Guild releases the Best Original and Adapted Screenplays, obviously the producer best produced film for 2017. So I wanted to take just a minute just to kind of go through these lists because on a previous episode last year, we actually did talk about the Screen Actors Guild Award nominees for best performance by an actor. So I wanted to just take a minute here to just cover quickly just what the screenplays were and then also what the producers think because the producers listing is a really good indicator for what could be nominated for a best picture nom for the Academy Awards coming up this year. So best original and best adapted screenplay. I'm sure you've heard this before if you've ever watched the Academy Awards. Maybe you're sitting there going, I don't know what the difference is. Let me kick this knowledge to you real quick so we can clarify everything up and we can get you guys on the same page. We can rock and roll forward into the Academy Awards. So Best Original Screenplay is a story that's written, a script that's written for film that has nothing else tied to it that was previously made. So it's not like they're taking a book or something like that and going, oh, this is a really good book. We should make a movie. Best Original is literally an original idea conceived by writer or writers, and then they pen the script for the film, and then the film gets made. Best Adapted, is something that is, like I just said, it's a story from a book, a comic book, a TV show, what have you. Someone sees something that exists right now and goes, you know what? I could probably kind of reword some things and add and thicken up the story a little bit to make this a really good movie. And then they take that existing idea and add to it and adapt it for the big screen. And that's the difference between the two categories, original and adapted screenplay. I hope that made sense. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into what the nominees were for best original screenplay. I have my notes right here. So let's go ahead and dive in. Best Original Screenplay, The Big Sick, Get Out, I, Tanya, Lady Bird, The Shape of Water. Now out of these five, I've only seen two, surprisingly. I still need to see Get Out and I really wanna see Get Out because Jordan Peele is gonna be taking over the Twilight Zone. So he must have done something beyond fantastic with Get Out to really just kind of do a, a commentary on society that has a nice twist to it, like what the Twilight Zone does. I was raised on the Twilight Zone. I love the Twilight Zone. So I'm excited to see Get Out more than ever after that news was announced. And then maybe I'll understand why this was considered the best, one of the best for original. The Big Sick, obviously one of my favorite comedies of last year. And The Shape of Water was hands down my favorite film of 2017. So no surprise that I'm on board for The Shape of Water. Let's go ahead and comment below if you have an opinion on those five films and which one, if you saw them all, or maybe you just saw one of them, which one you think deserves the award comment below. Best Adapted Screenplay. Call Me By Your Name, The Disaster Artist, Logan, Molly's Game, Mudbound. Now, for those of you who are going, what's Mudbound? Mudbound had a limited release in theaters because it's a Netflix film. So what they did was they said, we want to get awards consideration. And in order to do that, you got to be released in theaters. So they did a limited release for theaters so that it actually can be considered for award season. And that gamble paid off because they just got nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay. So that's on Netflix. Check it out. I haven't seen it yet. I need to now that I know it's nominated for sure. And then we can have a conversation about that at a later time. But uh, out of these, I really liked Molly's Game. Um, I will go ahead and throw up the card right here for that review that I did for Molly's Game. And you can check that out. 
Also, Logan was a spectacular film. It's not just a movie about Wolverine and the X-Men or younger X-Men or New Mutants or whatever you want to call them. It's a really well-told story about a, like a coming of age tale, trying to find your purpose, trying to find your meaning and just family and what it means to be a, a solid, cohesive unit. It's really just a great film overall. So definitely check out Logan if you haven't yet. That is on Blu-ray right now and you should be able to find it on a streaming service. So you can just like throw it right on through your Apple TV or your Roku or whatever. Check it out. But before you do that, comment below with which one of the adapted screenplays was your favorite. Now we're gonna move into the producers category and we're gonna take a look at 11 films that were nominated uh, for the outstanding producer of a feature motion picture. And those films are The Big Sick, Call Me By Your Name, Dunkirk, Get Out, I, Tanya, Lady Bird, Molly's Game, The Post, Shape of Water, Three Billboards Outside Ebon, Missouri, and Wonder Woman. So this list is stacked. There is a lot of talent on this list for producer. Now, most of these films, I did not see Call Me By Your Name. I did not see, as we said, Get Out. Still waiting for I, Tanya, and I still wanna see Lady Bird and The Post. The rest of them, Big Sick, Dunkirk, Molly's Game, Shape of Water, Three Billboards, Wonder Woman. There's so much great film on this list right here that it's just, I look at this and I go, wow, this is a competitive category because you can say what you want about films in 2017, like if you liked them or you didn't like them. The truth of the matter is, from my opinion, 2017 had a lot of really great movies drop. And this list right here is the shining example of that fact. So if I had if I had to pick one, obviously I'm picking The Shape of Water. I think The Shape of Water is just a brilliant film. And if you haven't seen The Shape of Water yet, I definitely recommend you check it out. Guillermo del Toro steps up to the plate and hits a grand slam with this film. It's so good. I think this is gonna be his swan song. 20 years from now, when people look back at film, I still think The Shape of Water is going to be talked about. And people will always remember what Guillermo del Toro did with this film on the budget that he set. Like the budget that he got for this film is crazy small for how much involvement is happening on screen between these characters and everything else. And to see like what he was able to do without a hundred million, two hundred million dollar budget is just incredible. But then the movie itself is equally incredible. There's just, it's just nothing but good things from me for this film. I recommend it was my favorite film of last year. The Shape of Water is a film you should absolutely see on the big screen in a room full of strangers that all love film. But I understand that all art is subjective. I've grown up in the arts. I get it. What I may love, you may hate and vice versa. No big deal. Water off my back. Comment below with what you think out of these 11 films was your favorite of the year. Again, Big Sick, Call Me By Your Name, Dunkirk, Get Out, I, Tanya, Lady Bird, Molly's Game, The Post, Shape of Water, Three Billboards Outside Ebon, Missouri, and Wonder Woman. Patty Jenkins, the director of Wonder Woman, said that Wonder Woman 2 will be a different film that's a totally new adventure. What I think she's saying here is that it's not really going to be holden to a sequel, right? The term sequel usually means like you've got to adhere to certain things. And what I like about the Wonder Woman character is in all of her appearances so far, whether it is in Batman versus Superman, Wonder Woman, or Justice League, the core of who Wonder Woman is isn't changing. And Patty Jenkins actually goes on to talk about how there are certain things that Wonder Woman won't do. And that's specific to who she feels that she is as a character and kind of what that character is going for and what the character is trying to achieve as far as like all of humanity and all of the human race is concerned. And I really like that. So when I hear these comments, I'm not sitting back there going, oh great, continuity is going out the window. Nobody knows what's going on. It's going to be so different. It won't even make sense. I don't think that's what she's talking about. I just think she's saying, look, this is going to be the second Wonder Woman film. It's not going to be Wonder Woman 2. It's going to be the second Wonder Woman film. It's going to take place in a different time period. She's already said that's what's going to happen. My big concern with this is how is it going to play into continuity of who Diana was in the Justice League? Because this is where things start to get a little hairy as far as timelines and writing go. Because we have the character of 
Wonder Woman, Princess Diana, whatever, in Justice League, and we know who she is at that time. But to get to that time, she had to go through all of these decades, all of these generations of war that mankind has brought upon itself, right? So when you look at where she came from, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, Cold War, everything that's going on in the Middle East, and it's just one war after another. And so you have to look at her timeline and go, well, if she's kind of been like in hiding, but trying to like do things through like subversive means. So she's almost been like a James Bondian Wonder Woman. And that's why like maybe she, it feels like she disappeared for all those years is because she didn't, but she, instead of just running around in her, you know, star spangled outfit, kicking booty, maybe she was like, actually, I'm gonna take a more subversive approach to this and try and be more kind of like a spy and do more espionage than just running around with a sword and shield beating people up. I don't know what this is going to have, if it's gonna be a Cold War, Korean War, if it's gonna have something to do with Vietnam. All we know is that it's going to be taking place at a different time than what it took place in the first one, and it won't be present day like what Justice League was. So where it gets a little hairy for me is going, okay, well, how are we going to make sure that this film doesn't really like screw up everything? And if it is going to screw up everything, as far as story goes, like at least make the screw up so big that we can all sit back and go, wow, they just really don't care about continuity, but this movie is fantastic. Comment below with your thoughts about the Wonder Woman sequel coming by Patty Jenkins. Director Matt Reeves signed a first look multi-year deal with Netflix. So what does that mean? Basically what this means is Matt Reeves, the director who did two of the Planet of the Apes films, also is working on a new Batman film right now. Any projects that happen after that, going forward now, he has to bring those projects to Netflix and say, hey, here's the next project I'm excited about that I wanna do as a director, and I have to bring it to you, Netflix, first. So Netflix doesn't have to take the deal, though. So if Matt Reeves brings them something, and it's like some crazy, like, weird science fiction meets horror meets, like, comic book meets love story thing, and it's just too out there for Netflix, Netflix can pass on that and say, yeah, we're not really feeling that. And then Matt Reeves can go to whatever studio wants to pick up the rights to that. So all he has to do though, is just bring it to Netflix first and say, hey, this is my new vision. This is the story I want to tell. And Netflix can say yay or nay on it. And what I'm thinking that Netflix wants to do is Netflix wants a very talented director in their stable of, for going forward for films that they can have some, uh, they can have some security with where they're looking at films and they're going, this guy knows how to tell really good, compelling stories and he has a really good name as a director. So when you hear Matt Reeves is directing a film, myself, I'm sure you, if you're watching this, that means you're a movie fan, your curiosity goes up and you get a little bit more excited because you're like, oh, Matt Reeves does a really good job. And I think that's the attitude that Netflix wants when you hear Matt Reeves' next picture on Netflix. They want to elevate themselves to a position that isn't just like, oh yeah, it's that streaming service we pay monthly. But I think Netflix really wants to get their foot in the door and really be a strong competitor as a film studio so that when you hear the term Netflix movies, you're not just thinking like, oh yeah, a movie that was done by some other company that I can watch on Netflix. But you get excited because you're like, wow, Netflix has really been knocking it out of the park with some of their original content. And I think bringing someone like Matt Reeves into the stable like that, where they have first approval on a film that he wants to do is really going to help them and really going to position them on the chessboard to have strong original content, which I desperately think they're trying to achieve achieve right now. Honorable mentions this week, Ridley Scott is in talks to direct a Merlin film for Disney. Netflix confirms Bright will get a sequel. Christian Bale confirmed that he was in talks to play a role in the new Han Solo movie. Lakeith Stanfield joins the cast of A Girl with a Dragon Tattoo sequel. DeWanda Wise joins Brie Larson in Marvel's Captain Marvel. All right, and that is the first news segment of 2018. Thank you guys so much for joining me through the news this week on the very first episode of 2018 here on Bernanski's vlog. This is season two, episode one. Very exciting. I feel it's very exciting. Do you feel it's very exciting? I'm sure you do. All right, let's go ahead and move now into the next segment, which if you're familiar with the show, you've already mentally prepared yourself for what's about to happen. If you're brand new to the show, this is the movie review segment where we give thoughts about films currently in theaters that I had an opportunity to get out to see for you guys on this channel. Let's go ahead and roll to the movie review segment right now. 
The film was almost completed and the release date was approaching. Then, one of the main characters had to be recast and all of their scenes reshot in an unprecedented fashion. And miraculously, the film was still released on time. Does all the money in the world deliver on an engaging and captivating story, or is this film better served as a natural sleep aid? Let's dive in and take a look in this review. So first, and probably most important, director Ridley Scott was able to really pull out top caliber A quality performances from his actors in delivering all of the emotions to us on the big screen. He didn't just pull out the best performance from the leads, he literally pulled out the best performances even from characters who were only in the film for maybe one scene. For example, young John Paul, played by Charlie Plummer, who is the captive in this story, has escaped and he is now eating dinner at a police officer's house. And the woman, the wife of the police officer, delivers such an engaging performance. And she's only in this one scene in the entire film that you know more is going on and not everything is as safe as it should be in this film for this character. Her performance alone was so great, I just couldn't take my eyes off of her because you're watching her movements, her subtle like looks and gestures, the fear on her face, like everything about it was just top notch. And again, she was only in it for one scene and Ridley Scott was able to pull out that type of performance from almost everybody in the cast. So it's moments like this kind of strewn throughout the film that elevated it from just an adequately acted film to an incredibly acted film. And then you had Mark Wahlberg. Understanding that his character was supposed to be more of like a black and white, cut and dry security guy who doesn't really get into the emotions of things. He's a negotiator. But still it was like, you. I didn't really believe he was the negotiator. I just believed that he was Mark Wahlberg in this film. And like some of his performance in this movie kind of pulled me out. However, everybody else in this film was delivering on such grade A performances that I really didn't mind how sterile his performance felt in comparison to everybody that was in this film or sharing screen time with him. Based on a true story, you're never really quite sure how well the story is gonna be adapted. And I'm happy to report that this film actually has a really well-written story from beginning to end. With movies that are based on true stories, you never quite know like what is going to be in it to move the plot forward or what is just going to be in it because of historical significance. And with this film, I felt like everything that was in it was in it for a purpose and they didn't really have just fluff to add for the sake of fluff. There wasn't really anything in this film that felt like it was there because it just was part of the overall real life story but did nothing for this film and the story that this film wanted to tell. It felt like all of the moments in this story were in this story for a particular reason and for that I was happy. In this film we get a sense for who the Gettys are, everybody's role in the film and what the patriarch of the family, his view is for the family name and how he wants to turn the Gettys into an American business dynasty. And while the patriarch, J. Paul Getty, played by Christopher Plummer, does feel a bit cold and abrasive at times, it's from beginning to end that we really get to know this character and we see that he takes great care and great attention for the family that is in his bloodline. So not everything is as cold and calculated as it is on the surface because if you fall in his bloodline directly, he does pay attention and he does take care of you. Because again, he's trying to build an American business dynasty and he needs those that fall in his bloodline to be available to pick up the mantle and run with the Getty name. If I had to give one negative critique of this film, it would be that the pacing and the tempo is not consistent and the time spent in the theater actually feels way longer than the actual runtime of this movie. There's some moments on screen that really move and are really quick paced and really keep you on the edge of your seat and then there are other moments where it just kind of falls and lingers and it feels like it's just going to take forever for that moment to pass. And unfortunately, towards the end of the movie, I was sitting in my seat wondering how much longer is this movie going to go on because it feels like this I've been in this theater for like three hours. And when I checked the runtime of the movie after I got out of the theater and saw that it's just over two hours, I was really surprised because it honestly felt like it was a three hour movie because of how slow some of the moments land in this film. So had the pacing and the tempo been a little bit more consistent and a little bit more upbeat to really continue to drive the plot from beginning to end, I think this film would have been an absolute home run. All the money in the world is playing at your local movie theater right now. 
and I'm not actually going to recommend a big screen viewing for this film. While I do feel that you should actually check this film out once it's available on a streaming service, or you can actually rent it from a red box, I definitely suggest checking it out there because I don't feel like you're going to miss anything in this movie from watching this film in the comfort of your own home. It's a very well acted film that does drag on at times throughout the story. However, it does deliver on showing us what it would be like to be alive and to have all the money in the world. And because it does drag on at times, I am only gonna be able to give this film one high five. All the Money in the World is playing at your local movie theater right now. Check it out. And before we close out the show, just want to cover what's dropping in theaters this week, what's dropping on DVD and Blu-ray this week, certified rad, and then we are out of here. So let's go ahead and jump into what movies are arriving at your local movie theater this week. The Post, The Commuter, Proud Mary, Paddington 2. So we got a little bit of something for everybody, it looks like. The Post looks like it's going to be a dramatic piece. I know it was trying to get out early enough in limited release so it could still be considered for award season. The Commuter, Liam Neeson, obviously bringing a lot of action right there on the train. Proud Mary, another action flick where we see that she's kind of like the female John Wick, if you will, from what the trailers look like. And then Paddington 2, which looks like it's going to be a fun family film. I know that the first Paddington movie got a lot of really high praise as far as the people who saw it and who reviewed it. I haven't seen it yet. I want to before I go see Paddington 2, so I kind of know what's going on. But if you saw Paddington, uh, go ahead and sound off below in the comments with your thoughts about the first one and if you're excited to see the sequel. All right, let's take a look at what's coming out for your home theaters this week. On DVD and Blu-ray this week, Marshall, The Foreigner, American Made, My Little Pony, The Movie. Again, just like what's arriving in theaters, what's arriving for your home theater is a pretty good selection. So you have a film like Marshall, which I still want to see, but it is a more dramatic biopic piece. And then you have The Foreigner, which is a fantastic action flick with Jackie Chan. Now that it's on DVD and Blu-ray, if you missed it in theaters, definitely check it out. American Made, also kind of a biopic based on a true story. It's kind of action. It's kind of spy. Uh, it goes up, it goes down. It's an okay movie, but definitely going to be more enjoyable at home. So check that out now that it's on Blu-ray. And then My Little Pony, the movie. I'm sure my nieces will be very happy that this is out on DVD and Blu-ray because they love My Little Pony. All right, that is it for what's dropping on your DVD and Blu-ray shelves this week. Let's go ahead and move now into the final segment, which is Certified Rad. All right, so for the very first Certified Rad of 2018, had to do a little research, try and find something online that really was, you know, big and awe-inspiring. Certified Rad, for those of you who aren't familiar with this segment, this can be anything. It could be a tech gear review, it could be a book review, it could be people helping people. It doesn't really matter if I find it, if someone sends it to me and they're like, check this out, and I read it, and I'm like, that is most definitely Certified Rad. We're gonna highlight it in this segment on the show. So for this week's Certified Rad, season two, episode one, first Certified Rad of 2018, we are going big. How big? I'll tell you. So Cole Hamels and his wife Heidi have been trying to sell their mansion for some time. How big is this mansion? It's over 100 acres and it's selling for over $9 million. And they really haven't been able to find somebody in the market at that level who really wanted to pick this up. So instead of just letting it set on the market forever and ever and ever, they decided to be super awesome and donate it to a charity. So as you can see here on the screen, it does look like something out of an X-Men comic book. This mansion looks like it belongs to, you know, Professor Xavier and his school for gifted youngsters. But Cam Barnabas specializes in providing a camp experience to special needs individuals and people with chronic illnesses. So this giant 100 plus acre mansion is now going to be home to people who have special needs or are chronically ill and they're just trying to have the best life that they can while they're still around to enjoy it. So as you know from watching season one, all the certified rads, we covered a lot of different people helping people stories, and this is no exception, because when you donate a gigantic mansion of over $9 million to help people with special needs and are chronically ill, you can guarantee that that is most definitely certified rad. <laughs> 
And that concludes episode one of season two or episode 23 if you've got a little ticker counter going. You can go ahead and just chalk this one up on the wall because we are getting out of here. Thank you so much for joining me for season two, episode one here on YouTube with Bernanski's vlog. Hope you guys enjoyed this first episode of season two as much as I enjoyed making it for you guys. If you did, please give me that thumbs up because it helps people who like movie related shows find us in the YouTube sphere. Also, if you're new here and you haven't yet clicked subscribe, now would be a great time to do that. And down below, you'll be able to see that we are on a lot of different social media. If you're into like movie trailer reviews, you will want to find us on the Stardust app because the Stardust app is where I do my movie trailer breakdowns. Also, we just launched the email. So if you guys are watching this and you have questions throughout the week about movie related topics, feel free to email me directly at Bernanski's vlog at gmail.com. Again, that's Bernanski's vlog, just like the title of the show in the YouTube channel. One long word, Bernanski's vlog at gmail.com. All right, everybody, I'm going to go ahead and get out of here because we are getting ready to go live on Facebook right after this episode. So we can go ahead and look at the Monday morning box office report and kind of take a look at what is happening in theaters over the weekend for you and I and what we were all seeing and spending our hard-earned dollars on as far as movies are concerned. All right, everybody, thanks so much again for joining me here. Season two, episode one. You guys are watching Bernanski's vlog on YouTube. Thank you so much. Don't forget to give me that thumbs up, click that subscribe button, and we will see you on Facebook Live. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. See you on Facebook Live. Hi, I'm Jeremy Bernanski, and you've just finished watching another episode of Bernanski's Vlog. Along with the weekly show, we also have special segments, as well as DVD and video on-demand reviews that you may want to check out. Thank you so much for watching this brand new episode, and we'll see you next Monday at 10 a.m. PST for another brand new episode of Bernanski's Vlog. Have a great week, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.